Good morning, good morning, Prince Brother. How are you this morning? Glad each and every one of you is here. We're here to sing praises and songs to our Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, does everybody like God's coloring book, how it's all looking? And just the beautiful uh, leaves. And I got a, we had a plant manager that retired about a year and a half ago or so. He was telling me him and his wife had took a trip look, looking at the lighthouses. And he said, just, it's just beautiful up there right now, this time of year in Michigan. And so, uh, yeah, I just thank God for his overwhelming beauty. Yeah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for, Lord, we thank you for the scenery out here in fall. And God, we just thank you for, once again, for letting us be able to look upon your beauty of what you have created. And God, it's just so wonderful to, uh, to know that, Father, through these seasons and through these changes that you are in control. And, Father, we just uh, pray for people that's going through the, the worst storms of it, Father, of uh, these hurricanes. And, Father, we just ask that you lay your hand upon them and help them get back recovered. And, and Father, for everybody to uh, just join as a community, just great stories popping up left and right about that, how people just coming on board. And, Father, we thank you for that assurance and what we're supposed to do to help each other. And God, we're just so glad this morning, Father, that we could come in your house here and praise you. Amen. And Father, as we sing you, we're going to sing to you this morning the first song, Praise You in This Storm, God. We just ask that, Father, that any storm that anybody's going through in their life, Father, let them just, as the song says, just raise their hands and praise you in this storm. Father, as James tells us, uh, consider it a pure joy when we go through times of trials. And Father, we just thank you for that. And Father, for your word and your sweet Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Let's sing this to him. Praise you in this storm. If anything on your heart this morning, anything going on in your life, uh, I know we call this the heart hospital. Just uh, give it to the Lord. And let's sing this to him this morning. <laughs>
perseverance and then it brings up more strength and gives us to go through the other one. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you for those storms. And through those storms, his love defends us. Matt Mayer writes a beautiful song here. Uh, hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. You are my portion and you are my salvation. We thank you, Lord, for that. Your love defends us. God is in our corner. Nobody can pluck us out of his Amen. hand. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this to him this morning. Your love defends me.
be with those people that aren't here today. Be with anyone here that's fighting a battle, Lord, and just, we know you are the defender, the Almighty, Lord. Once again, we give all the glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All God's people say, are we ready? Amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Good morning. You can have a seat. Welcome to our worship service on this Lord's Day. As we get started, I do have a few announcements to let you know about. First of all, uh, this is in the digital bulletin, uh, but if, as I prepared our sermons on, this, on the uh, Fruit of the Spirit, um, I am using a book called Cultivating the Fruit of the Spirit by Christopher Wright. I'm enjoying it so far. Uh, it really helps you kind of think through what does Scripture have to say about each of these individual uh, fruits that, that Paul tells us about that are produced through the Holy Spirit's uh, involvement in our lives. So if you are interested in that, I think you can pick it up on Amazon for $10 or something like that. Uh, so it's been a very enjoyable read so far. Also, if you uh, watch the Dining Room Devos that, uh, that we publish three times a week, I want to let you know that we're going to begin publishing those this week at about 4.45 a.m. Don't worry, I'm not up that early. It just automatically goes online at, at that time. But that's so that if you go into work early or if you're up early and you like to watch it earlier in the day rather than at lunch time, it gives you the ability to do that. Uh, so it'll be up on, on uh, YouTube a little bit earlier in the day. And then also in the digital bulletin, the Brethren Church every once in a while sends out information about what's going on in the Brethren Churches around the world. And uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Brethren Church in India. It's one of our primary mission points around the world. If you haven't heard the story of how the Brother Church in India started, it's, it's really incredible. This guy came to Ashland Seminary from India uh, named uh, Prasant Kumar, his wife Nirmala. And uh, they just came to seminary to, to, to be trained in the pastorate. And Prasant had a vision that he wanted to go back to India and reach people for Christ. And so uh, there in Ashland, he developed a relationship with the Brethren Church. And the Brethren Church blessed them and, and decided to support them financially, sent uh, Prasant and Ramallah back, into, uh, back to India, and they began a church there. And over the last, I think it's been 40 or 50, maybe 50 years now, that has grown to the, the Brethren Church in India is far larger than the Brethren Church in the United States. They have something like 100 different preaching points uh, this uh, talks about in this missions in a minute. It's on the bottom of the uh, um, the digital bulletin if, if you've got it. But it talks about how there were over 300 bapti baptisms last year in the Brethren Church in India. So they do some incredible mission work. I'm just encouraged you to keep the, the Brethren Church in India in prayer. A couple of things that it talks about uh, in the missions minute is first of all they do have a medical clinic that you know, they're in a very poor part of India, and, and so people don't have access to basic health care, even things like Tylenol uh, or, or uh, cream, to, you know, and, um, antibiotic cream. They don't have those kind of things, and so they can go to the Brethren Clinic and they can get those things for at a very low cost. But another thing that they've done for years and years, it's incredible, is that they have a sewing school. So they bring in these young ladies that have no uh, marketable skills, and they teach them how to sew so they can find a job in a factory and provide for their family. Uh, and, and something as simple as, well, I said, well, I don't know how to use a sewing machine, uh, but, but having the skill of sewing really sets these young ladies up for a successful career. And so they've done this for years and years, and while they do that, they teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so some great things are happening in India, but even though they have, the, the, where the Brethren Church is in India, traditionally has been fairly free of persecution. That is, uh, persecution is becoming more of a reality for the Brethren in India. So keep them in prayer. So uh, if you need a copy of this, let me know. If you weren't able to get in the digital bulletin, we can get you copies of that. But those are just some announcements I wanted to bring to you as we begin our worship service today. But at this time, I think we are ready for our children's message. that little kitty. Doesn't he look so happy with his leg out of his basket? He doesn't have a care in the world. That to me is comforter. So our verse today is from 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And again, that's 2 Corinthians 13, 4. So as we talk about comfort today, I bet you guys will recognize some of these animals. Megan, you might, you might know all these guys here. Aaron's going to help me. When we think of comfort, sometimes we think of teddy bears because they can really be friendly and make us feel better when we're feeling a little lonely or sad. So Aaron, you can, you can hold this animal here. Some of them are nice and soft and fuzzy, and this guy has a little message. He says, Happy Valentine's Day, so he can make us feel loved and comforted. And there's Aaron's Easter bear. That guy came from Nana in Florida. That was a special bear, wasn't it? Because it came from a special person. So that one is a really comforting guy. Here's a little guy. Can you hold him too? Do you have enough arms for all these bears? Okay. He's a little Camp Shipshawana bear. And he was a little present at camp to keep someone feeling safe and not homesick at camp. Megan, do you recognize this bear? You don't recognize him? This was the baby, the bear you got when you were a baby at the hospital. Build a bear sent this to you at the hospital. It had a little pink shirt that had your birth weight and name and all of that on there. But I took it off because I don't know if anyone, you wanted everyone to know how scrawny you were when you were a baby. It might be embarrassing. Okay. And of course, this guy. He's different than all the others. Aaron, do you remember what his name is? Want to tell everybody what his name is? Gusher. Do you remember why he was named Gusher? Probably not. We named him Gusher because he came from the fair. We want him at the fair. And if you move him very much, he um, gushes foam everywhere. And I have sown Gusher so many times, but he still leaks. But Gusher is a favorite because he's so, he's so foamy and squishy, but he gets, he's getting foam all over you, isn't he? But he's so cuddly to squeeze. So Gusher is one of our favorites too, isn't he? So bears can give us comfort if we're at camp or I think this bear was more comfort to mom when Megan was born in the hospital and from grandmas and people who love us. But there's somebody who comforts us even more than teddy bears. Okay, so teddy bears are great because they don't ever share your secrets and they're good listeners and they're always kind. They're always willing to do what you want to do. They never argue. If you want to play Minecraft all day, they'll sit there and watch you. You don't have to buy them a ticket if you want them to go to the football game or to the play. So mom and dad like them because they're a cheap friend. And people uh, might judge your baby blanket if it's all ratty and disgusting. You know, the one you've carried around since you were born. But teddy bears are kind of cute. People usually talk to you and not judge you as much. But again, they're not the best friend that you'll ever have. Because Jesus comforts us more than a teddy bear. Jesus is always close. And he always shares our deepest hurts and worries. We can talk to him in prayer, and he speaks um, to us when we listen for his voice. A teddy bear can be comforting, but God can make us make a real difference in our life. God is big enough to comfort all of us at the same time. We couldn't really share gusher. Everybody couldn't squeeze him at the same time, could they? But God's big enough for all of us at the same time. So, we need to remember this week, bear care is great, but God's care is best. Can you help me with all these bears, Aaron? Yeah. <laughs> I think I still have my baby blanket, but I don't carry it around. <laughs> At least not out in public, I don't. Good morning. Good morning. Um couple things that we want to remember from last week moving forward. Um, Ethan Wessler is still in Texas, right? And doing good in his quarantine? Doing good. Okay. And then does he know yet where he's going to go? He'll be in Texas for six months. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to keep Ethan in our prayers as he's preparing for his next assignment. And then um, Brenda Weaver is having surgery coming up on the... 21st on our hand. Um, then McEwen's, Chad and April, is it, where can we go? Ethan. Ethan is sick. He was tested and it came back negative, but they were going to test him again because the symptoms are COVID, <clears throat> COVID symptoms. So 
We want to remember the whole family that they stay healthy. Anybody have any other praises or prayer concerns? I would like to pray for my niece. Um, her name is Sue. Uh, she has been having seizures and they won't stop. They're just not stopping with all the other that mom's surgery went well she's recovering nicely and uh, she's up moving around more so hopefully that will continue anybody else okay let's go to the Lord in prayer Heavenly Father we we can give you thanks for the beautiful day that you've left us with um, even though fall is a sign that winter is coming, um, it is a beautiful time. And uh, with the sunshine and the leaves changing out there this morning, uh, it is a beautiful day. And we know that you created it for us. We give you thanks for that. Father, we also have some praises we want to lift up to you. I'm thankful that mom's surgery went well and that she's getting back up, moving around uh, more and more every day. And uh, we just pray for continued quick healing there. And Lord, uh, we want to lift up Ethan Wessler as he's continuing to be in quarantine. Um, he's not sick, but he's just protocol, and uh, we're, we're thankful that he's that he is healthy and he's preparing for his next assignment. And we just pray for protection over him. And Lord, as Brenda's surgery is coming up on the 21st, we again just want to lift that up to you that you would be with the doctors and the nurses and guide them and direct them and that that uh, surgery will go well and she will have a quick recovery. Also, uh, Chad and April with Ethan being sick, we're thankful that the first test result was a negative and we pray that the next one will be negative as well. We Lord, just be with the rest of the family that they do not get sick. Keep them all healthy. We want to lift up Ruby's niece, Sue, as she continues to have seizures more and more frequently, Lord, we just ask that uh, your peace would be upon her. Um, be with Ruby as, as a comforter to her. Um, we just pray that she knows you, Lord, that she would know you and would draw closer to you through this. And also for Ruby's biopsy that's coming up, Lord, we just pray for good results there. Give her peace and comfort and let her know that you are in control. Lord, for Kim's friend Becky, who's fighting cancer yet again, um, we find peace and comfort that she was able to be a part of her daughter's wedding. And uh, Lord, we just ask that you be with the whole family as 
they prepare for her passing and Lord we're thankful that she knows you and knows where she's going and everything else Lord we just thank you again for all the blessings you give us every day Lord be with Willie and Kim as they prepare for the Cowboys for Christ next Saturday we ask that uh, you would be with all the riders keep them safe we pray for good weather and that uh, your message will will reach someone there who like Willie always says this is the only church they know and so Lord we just pray for uh, your will to be done there Lord again we thank you for this day guide us and direct us as we go forward through this week in Jesus name we pray amen amen the scripture this morning comes from Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In his name. Blessed assurance, Jesus Amen. is mine. We can boldly go to the throne of his grace. Please stand as we sit.
And the reason I chose grapes, honestly, is because in Scripture, in the Old Testament, and really, really throughout human history, grapes have been a symbol of joy. Uh, grapes, of course, which are used to produce wine, and wine historically, and in the Old Testament, Scripture is often seen as a symbol of joy, of celebration, of abundance. If you remember uh, the story where the spies uh, were sent into the promised land, and they came back, what was one of the signs of abundance uh, of the land uh, that they were going to go to was that there was this huge bunch of grapes that took two people to carry this bunch of grapes on a pole. And that was some of the evidence that, yeah, where we're going, there is a lot of food. There, there's good farmland. That was a symbol of blessing. And so uh, if, if you will indulge me, we're going to use these grapes today to, to represent the fruit of joy. But before we get into the importance of joy and, and, and what we should be joyful for, I want to start in Galatians 5, looking at not the, the passage about the fruit of the Spirit, but backing up a little bit uh, to verses 16 through 18. Because Paul is speaking about the importance of living in the Spirit, living by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is what he says, beginning in verse 16. He says, so I say, walk in the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do whatever you want. But if you were led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, what is Paul saying in this passage? Well, one thing that I think our world has gone wrong in many ways, but one of the biggest areas that the world has gone wrong is this whole idea that whatever you want, you should do because it's an expression of yourself. It's an expression of your own desire. That there's nothing wrong with those desires. So indulge them, is kind of what the world says. Now, that idea, by the way, is not new. In fact, Paul addressed it in some of his letters. Uh, in one passage, uh, Paul quotes... Uh, an idiom of the day uh, that said food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Have you read that scripture? Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Paul did not come up with that himself. He was quoting a very popular saying in the day. And the purpose of that saying, what, it, what that meant in Greek culture was, hey, you know, just like your stomach needs food, you've got to fill it. So whatever desires you have, just go ahead and take care of it because there's no, si no sense fighting against those natural human urges. So go ahead and do whatever you want. Paul was saying, no, that's not what we should do. He's saying that, that expression that's commonly used today is not one that we want to live by as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ. Paul says that these there are sinful desires that fight against us as Christians. Now, when before we knew Jesus, we didn't know any better. We just did whatever those sinful urges told us to do. But now that we're in Christ, we don't want to follow those. So he says, live by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, when we put our faith in Jesus, we decide to follow him. The Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of us as a seal guaranteeing our inheritance in Christ. And so the Holy Spirit is in us and it transforms us, makes us more like Jesus. And so we have the Holy Spirit saying, this is the way I want you to live. And then we have a sinful nature that we still fight against saying, no, go ahead and do these things because that's what you want. And the two are fighting against each other. Think of arm wrestling, right? Who's arm wrestled before, right? Show who's strongest. Only the problem is that we're arm wrestling ourselves in essence. We have the Holy Spirit in one arm saying, we're going to go this way. And then the sinful nature is kind of fighting against us. And so if we want to be successful and please God with the way we live, it comes down to which muscles are we exercising. Are we allowing those sinful nature muscles to control us? Because if we give them the upper hand, we're going to have a hard time living by the Spirit. But if instead we're choosing to live by the Holy Spirit, then what happens is we strengthen that muscle and we can keep those sinful desires within us in check. So which arm are you exercising? Which arm are you strengthening? And then he goes on from there. We're not going to, to spend a lot of time in these verses, but verses 19 to 21, uh, immediately before uh, the, the list of the, the gifts, or excuse me, of the fruit of the Spirit, he talks about the acts of the sinful nature. He lists some of them. We talked about some of those last week. 
If you exercise wickedness, that's what you're going to see. What do you listen verses 19, 19 through 22? But if you exercise connection with the Holy Spirit and you live in connection with him, the evidence that you are doing that is the fruit of the Spirit that he lists. Verses 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The evidence that you live in connection with the Spirit is that you will not gratify that sinful nature. And in fact, those actions will become less attractive to you over time. You won't desire them as much because you're living by the Spirit who's teaching you, you know what, you don't really want those things. You don't want to live that way. The, the, the muscle of the sinful nature will become weaker in your life. But today we're talking about joy. As I mentioned, I'm using this book, Cultivating the, the Fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're, if you're interested in the subject, to pick up a copy of this book. Um, it really has been uh, is helpful to me as we are going through this sermon series. But I want to talk this morning about four things that we have that we should be joyful about as we look at the, the fruit of joy in our lives. And the first of those four things is that we rejoice in family. If you have to uh, print out the digital bulletin, you can write these in in the outline. But we rejoice in family. Now, for most of us, our family is a source of joy, maybe also a source of frustration at times, but we take joy in our family. A couple weeks ago, you know, Jonathan and Nate were selling uh, cookie dough for football, raise money for the football team. And so two weeks ago, we went and we delivered uh, some cookie dough to some relatives of mine, uh, two sets of aunts and uncles uh, that live in Elkhart and in Cassopolis. And so we went and got to see those. And we realized that Jamie and I were talking to them that it had been almost a year since we had seen them, which in our family is just incredible because ever since I was little, the East Step family, we get together like every holiday. Right? I mean, ever since Grandma and Grandpa raised us that way. And, and all of us kind of lose about a half hour of each other. And so we would get together every Easter. We'd get together once or twice during the summer, Thanksgiving, Christmas. We're together. And we spent time with the family last Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas. We decided we were just going to stay home. And so we did. And we realized that because of COVID, we haven't had any get togethers, didn't get together, get together at Easter. We haven't had any parties. This summer, and we're like, my goodness, these people that we love so much, it's been almost a year since we spent time with them. So it was so awesome just to be able to catch up and, and see what's going on in their lives, you know. I love that we love each other, and that's been important to our family. And with Jamie, my own family, with the five kids, I love that, that they get along. Now, they're brothers and sisters, so they have their moments, right? But I look at them and I'm like, they get along pretty good, which is pretty incredible. We love one another. We rejoice in our family. Now, not everybody has that kind of experience with their, their blood family. There might be tension. There might be uh, struggles that you've had as a family. Uh, and so not everybody certainly can say that their family experience has, has been a, a source of great joy in their lives. But... The important thing is that in Jesus Christ, we have family. Amen? Amen? We have spiritual family in Jesus Christ through the church. We belong to a loving family, which brings peace and it brings security. When we're struggling, we know that there's people that are struggling with us. that can lift us up in prayer. We can pray for one another. We can encourage one another. When we're having health problems, we can encourage those uh, who are having those health problems. And if we've experienced health problems, we can share from the comfort we've already received from others. We can be there for each other the way a good family should. And so what we learn from this is that relationships bring joy. Relationships with others bring joy. Now Paul writes about this in Ephesians chapter 2. He says this in Ephesians 2 verses 12 and 13. Uh, he says, and he's speaking to Gentile Christians here. Those who had, before they met Jesus, weren't really familiar with the, the, the Jewish concept of, of being together, having an identity of the promises of God. And he says, remember that at that time, that is before Christ, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, 
without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. What is Paul saying to these Gentile believers? He's saying, at one point, you had no hope of uh, blessed assurance. You had no hope of, of the kingdom of God. It was foreign to you. But now, through Jesus Christ, you have been brought near. You did not have a spiritual family, but now you do. You are, you're not even Jewish, but still, you are brought into the family of God. So all who embrace the cross of Jesus now belong to each other. We're worshiping here in New Paris on a Sunday morning, but all over the world today, there's one church that is gathered together uh, in every nation on earth, people of different colors, of different uh, uh, races, of different backgrounds. Now, the Brother Church in India is meeting this morning. A few hours later, or maybe a few hours earlier, <laughs> But they're meeting together and they're praising the same Jesus that we praise here. I don't know if they're singing the same songs, probably not, but they're worshiping the same Savior and we belong together. And that's a good thing. We have that comfort and that gives us joy to know that. Church where Jamie and I grew up, there was a hymn that we would sing. Uh, and we would only sing it when we welcomed new members into the church. And it was a hymn that was called Welcome to the family. And it was just a fun little song of welcome to the family. We're so glad that you're here and you're going to love, you're going to support us and we're going to support you. And we'd only sing it then, but it became a special song. You see, because we belong to a family, we can welcome one another. We can welcome others into the family. We can practice hospitality. We rejoice in family. The second thing that we rejoice in is feasting. We rejoice in feasting. Of course, you can't help but think, think of Thanksgiving, especially this time of year, right? I mean, the, the leaves are turning color, and, and they've already got all the Thanksgiving decorations you know, at the stores and things. We, we think about Thanksgiving. That's a time of great feasting, isn't it? And if you're like me, every Thanksgiving I eat way too much, and I end up in some kind of a food coma. But here's the thing, is that the, one of the great things about Thanksgiving, about great feasts, is that even though you eat so much, you still can't eat everything, can you? I mean, it's like, which of these things am I going to eat? And it's just, it's a fun feeling to see there is all this abundance. Or another way you can think of it is, it's not really feasting in the, in the eating sense, but think of a, the joy in a child's face on Christmas morning when they see all those presents under the tree. What brings joy? Abundance brings joy. Abundance brings joy. You might say, well, yeah, but, but Pastor Jeff, I don't, what if you don't have like an abundance? What if you don't have an abundance of, of things? I mean, does joy depend on, on how much we have in our checking account? Does joy depend on what kind of possessions we have? Does joy depend on whether we feel like we have more relationships than, than we could ever ask for? And the answer, of course, is no. Joy does, joy does not depend on those things. That's the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness changes from one moment to the next. It's an emotion. You know, I may feel happy right now, and then something happens, and that happiness goes away. Joy is deeper, though. It resides within the heart, within the spirit, and it's because of the we understand the abundance that we have in Jesus Christ. Some of the most joyful people I've ever know, known are people that don't have a lot on this earth. But they have a deep and abiding joy. Why? Because when we're living in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit reminds us of all of the blessings we have. That we have an abundance of blessings in our life. So at our house, laundry is a big deal. There's seven of us, and so we're always doing laundry. I'm sure I've talked about this before. Jamie's been on laundry duty like all weekend trying to catch up on things. She's done a great job of it. But you know, the thing about laundry in our house is that like we can get caught up and there's nothing in the hamper and we feel really good. And if we let it rest for 24 hours, we're underwater again. And let me tell you, when I feel like the laundry situation is hopeless in my house, I get pretty grumpy about it. 
I'll be honest with you. And there's been a, it was a time a couple weeks ago, I was getting grumpy about laundry, and I'm never going to get caught up and everything. And I kind of felt God whisper, aren't you glad you have so many clothes to get dirty? <laughs> yes, Lord! Because <laughs> it's true. We are so blessed. And sometimes even when we're grumpy, we shouldn't be because we're grumpy because we're blessed. We're grumpy because we have so much abundance uh, that dealing with the abundance can make us grumpy. We are so blessed. And, and even if we go beyond just what the things we have, we remember that, you know what, even if I don't have much or if I'm not happy with what I have, the reality is that Paul tells us in Ephesians 1-3 that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. God has left nothing out for us. We have every spiritual blessing we could ask for through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so what should a recognition of that level of blessing, that level of abundance, have in our lives? Well, the recognition of that blessing, because remember, we're not just talking about what the fruit of the Spirit is. The whole idea, the reason that we're choosing actual, you know, well, not actual, but, but plastic fruit, is a representation that the fruit of the Spirit is tangible in our lives. It should be a there should be evidence of it that other people should see. They should see that fruit in our lives, and so we want to be tangible about this. So, what is a tangible uh, aspect of recognizing that we are abundantly blessed, that we have joy in feasting? It is that we should desire to share with other people. Generosity is a tangible result of joy in our lives. We see it in the early church in, in the book of Acts where they were so blessed that they, they had found Christ. They put their faith in Jesus. They were looking forward to the kingdom of God and it said they shared everything they had. If you needed something and I had it, I was going to give it to you because we are all one in Christ Jesus and we are so incredibly thankful for the salvation that we have. And Jesus commanded this kind of generosity as well. He says this in the, in the book of Luke. Verse, uh, chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, Jesus talks about our need to be generous. He says, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. What is Jesus here saying about generosity? What is the ultimate generosity? It's, it's not shown when we are generous to people that we know are just going to return the favor later. Generosity is shown when we're abundantly showing love and generosity to people that are never going to be able to pay us back. We're doing that out of a genuine heart and really just wanting to share what we have with other people. Jesus says, then you'll be blessed. And at the resurrection of the righteous, when I return to the earth, your blessing will be even more. But generosity is the outflow of a heart that is filled with joy. So if we find in our lives at times that we're not, we're not being generous, we need to ask ourselves the question. We need to ask, is the fruit of joy ripening in my life the way it needs to? Because if I'm filled with joy, it will overflow in generosity. We rejoice in family. We rejoice in feasting. The third one is that we rejoice in our faith. We rejoice in our faith. Now what is this about? There's a story of a church in New England that in front of the pulpit, there is this very large, really ugly wooden cross made of railroad ties. It was rough. It was huge. It was like 10 feet tall, and it was positioned in front of, of the, the podium in such a way that it was really hard to see the pastor preaching because if you're looking at the pastor, all you're really seeing is this big, ugly, wooden cross. And there was leadership in the church were asking the question, is it really just time to kind of get rid of this thing or move it so we can see our preacher? And the pastor's response was, no, we're not getting rid of it. Because when I preach, I don't want you to see me. I want you to see the cross. I want you to see Jesus. The cross is central 
to who we are. And if, when it comes to the joy in our lives, our faith in the cross, our faith in Jesus is central. It needs to be our focus. We cannot forget the cross. If we need joy in our lives, we need to look at what brought us to faith in Christ, and that's the sacrifice that he made for us. And I find in my life that many times when I lose my joy, it's because I, keep, I take my focus off of the cross. I take my focus off of what God has done to restore me to himself, and I focus instead on whatever circumstance I am stuck in at the moment. I can't, look, I can't look past that. Instead, what I need to do is look to the cross. Because the truth is that I was a sinner on the road to, to hell. When it came to my eternity, it was hanging precariously over a fiery pit. What my faith tells me is that God sent his own son to take my sin. Jesus Christ became a curse for me. He took God's wrath at my sin. Jesus died his life for mine. But that wasn't the end of it because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, defeating death on the third day, and then he went back into heaven and Jesus is right now and has been every moment since he went back into heaven praying for me. Each and every moment of each and every day, Jesus Christ, my Savior, is pleading on behalf of me to God the Father for the grace that I need to get through every moment of every day. And he has invited me to be forgiven, to become adopted as a child of God. And we are told in Ephesians that I am now seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Think about that. I was dangling over hell, now I'm seated with him in heaven. That's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. And you could say, well, yeah, but Pastor Jeff, you just told us a few weeks ago that like, you accepted Jesus in your mom's car when you were five years old. Like, How much sinning had you really done before you put your faith in Jesus because you were five years old? Like, Did you steal your brother's tinker toys or something? I mean, what exactly... You weren't very far down that road to hell before you found Jesus. And I guess my response to that would be, well, does it really matter? I know some of you in this congregation can identify with this, but if you've been healed of cancer, does it really matter to you very much whether your cancer was stage one or stage four? Is it really that important? You've been healed. You rejoice in your healing. You rejoice that God has rescued you and saved you. It doesn't matter how far down the road to destruction you were. The fact is you were on the road to destruction and you have now been saved from that. You have been forgiven. And that includes past sin, present sin, future sin. I have sinned a lot more after I put my faith in Jesus than I did before. That is very true because I accepted Jesus when I was five years old. But guess what? God's grace continues to be there. And he continues to forgive me for all of my sin after I put my faith in Jesus. Not just the sin that I committed before I put my faith in Jesus. Every single one of us was headed to hell if not for Jesus. And it doesn't matter whether we found Jesus in preschool or the school of hard knocks. We have been saved. We rejoice in our faith. And so if we struggle at times to, to, to have the joy in our lives, maybe we need to, to lean into the Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, help me to remember why my salvation is so important and what Jesus Christ has done for me. Part of the tangible outflow of, of the Spirit's work in our lives is that people should be able to see a joyful attitude in us because we remember what our faith means, that we've been restored to God, that no matter what circumstances are happening in our lives, that we know we are assured of our salvation. We rejoice in family. We rejoice in feasting. We rejoice in our faith. And then the final one, we rejoice in our future. What we just sang about. Jesus is mine. Visions of rapture. Knowing that he's returning for us. I'm not going to preach much on this. Instead, I decided, you know what? God's word is going to tell us much better than I am. I'm just going to look at a few passages of scripture. I'm going to read them to you about what our future is in Jesus Christ. And I hope that we can find reason to rejoice in that this morning. 
First of all, John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Amen. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Next one I want to read is Micah 4, verses 1 through 5. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples, and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Next, Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the, his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Two more for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. You're probably familiar with this one. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Yeah. And finally, we look at this a little while ago when we were in Revelation, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's people, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. If we have a glorious, joyful future to look forward to, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Now, joy does not mean that we pretend that we don't have our problems, does it? It doesn't mean we simply ignore the things that trouble us. It doesn't pretend life isn't hard. Instead, joy endures despite our struggles. In fact, it changes our perspective on our troubles. It puts a yeah, but to our problems. Life is hard right now. Yeah, but I have a glorious future. I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent this month. Yeah, but I have every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. My family's having problems. Yeah, but 
I have a family of God that's here to support me every day of the week. The Holy Spirit reminds us that no problems that we have are heavier than the weight of, of God's glory that has been revealed to us. In Christ, we belong. We have abundance. We have salvation. And we have a future. And as I close today, I think it's probably pretty safe to say that in 2020, I think joy has taken a bit of a beating. <laughs> Hasn't it? There's a lot that can take our eyes off of the cross in 2020. That is certainly true. I just want to ask the question, how is the fruit of joy in your life this morning? And as we close, I don't know if it's COVID appropriate to do an altar call or not, but this altar is always open. Amen. If you feel like you need to come up, or if you feel like you just need to stay where you're at and raise your hand, that the altar is anywhere that you are communing with God. So you don't have to come here. You can stand right in your seat. Lift your hands to heaven. But let's, if we have a lack of joy in our lives, if the, we're not living in the spirit in such a way that we see that fruit coming through, we can repent of that. And say, Lord, I'm coming back to you. I'm going to focus on your spirit and what you've done for me. Rejoicing that I have a family, rejoicing that I am abundantly blessed, rejoicing in my faith because through that faith you have saved me and brought me to yourself, and I can rejoice because I have a glorious future ahead of me because of the promises of your word. You are so good to us. Amen. The enduring refrain in the Old Testament in the Psalms. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. We have so much to be joyful for. And joy is not something that we manufacture. It's not something that we can just will ourselves to do. Lord, when we live by your spirit, when we choose to worship you, as we sang this morning, Lord, in the, in the first song we sang, I will praise you in the storm. It's a choice. I will lift my hands. Because you are who you are. And you're a God that has blessed us with belonging. No matter who we were before we found Jesus, no matter what sinful habits we had, no matter what our family life was like, no matter what our background was, whether we were rich or we were poor, we were downtrodden, we were successful by the world standards, it doesn't matter. Whoever we were, we now have a place in Jesus Christ. We have a family. We are knit together by your grace. And Lord, not only that, but we have an abundance of blessings. Not necessarily by the world standard, but we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Help us to find joy through the Holy Spirit in that. And Lord, we rejoice in our faith. You saw us. You took the initiative in giving your life for us. You were raised to new life. You are at the right hand of the Father. And we rejoice that you have drawn us near by the blood of Jesus. And Lord, that opens up for a way uh, for us the way of your promises which are, that are in Scripture. We are but aliens and strangers here on earth, but Lord, we are citizens of heaven, and one day, very soon, that kingdom is going to be made real and permanent. And we are going to be with you in your presence forever, along with all of those who've gone before who put their faith in Jesus and are now with you, we will be reunited. That gives us joy. Yeah. So Lord, if we've chosen not to walk in that joy, we repent of it this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And allow your Holy Spirit to work within us so that the, the fruit of joy becomes more real. 
And we pray that that joy would be made evident in our lives. Father, through hospitality, through welcoming others, through generosity, and Lord, in our attitude, may we exude joy. And we pray all these things in the name of our, our risen Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Please stand as we sing our closing hymn, I'll Fly Away. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.